I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Barry Giesbrecht. He's a professor of psychological and brain sciences at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he runs the Attention Lab. Barry, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Adam, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and have a good discussion with you. Looking forward to it. You study the neuroscience of attention. As you mentioned in our exchange uh, before we met, attention is a very, very broad topic. So how did you get there? And what specifically do you focus on on attention? Uh, well, that's a, uh, that's a very good question. Um, my path to studying attention has kind of been circuitous. Uh, um, you know, when I went into undergrad, I didn't really know anything about psychology. In fact, I was going in to be a physical education teacher. Um, and mm -hmm. um, I took a psychology class and started to get really interested in cognitive psychology. And then I took a research methods class with a professor whose name was Don Reed, um, who really influenced my early kind of experiences with research methods. And I was shocked that you could study psychology as a, in a, in a using the scientific method. Um, my, at my high school, you know, the idea that we got exposed to in psychology there was purely clinical and largely influenced by kind of uh, um, ideas about Freud and that kind of thing and not that it's actually a science. Um, and when I found out that you could study it scientifically, that was kind of blew my mind. Um, and, and so from there, I kind of got various different experiences doing research. Um, and as when I did my honors thesis, I was lucky to be mentored by uh, Pierre Jolicoeur, who's at the University of Montreal, um, at, who is now there. He was at the University of Waterloo um, at the time when I was an undergraduate. And he introduced me to this phenomenon called the attentional blank. Um, and that phenomenon is this phenomenon where um, when you're asked to identify two targets in rapid succession, you have no problems getting the first one, but you have a great deal of difficulty getting the second one. Um, and that difficulty lasts for about a half a second. Um, and at the time when I was an undergrad, there was only a couple of studies that had uh, investigated this um, phenomenon. Um, and what does the target look like or what the whole experiment look like? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there's a variety of ways in which you can induce this attentional blink. Um, so in some of the early classic studies, so it was initially discovered um, 1987 um, by Broadbent and Broadbent, um, uh, and uh, at the same in the same year, Weishelgartner and Sperling uh, reported a similar phenomenon in science. But they used um, very simple stimuli like letters and digits. Um, the term attentional blink was first uh, coined by um, uh, Jane Raymond and Kim Shapiro, uh, and in, in their studies, basically, what happened is subjects would see the sequence of black. Uh, uh, letters and digits, um, and within which they had to identify the only white one. Um, and then half the time, a uh, second target was present or absent, a predefined identity, and they just had to, and the subjects had to indicate what the identity of the white item was and whether the second one was present or absent. And Is there an in between sort of attention where you can say, oh, something was there, but I don't remember what it was? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes. Um, and so I, so I do these demonstrations in my class all the time and, and people have this inkling that there is a second thing there, um, but they just can't report what it is. Uh, and, but typically when we do these studies experimentally, you know, it's, they're forced to choose um, a sp specific identity. And so oftentimes they're incorrect. Um, uh, even though they may have this inkling that something was there. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a ton of different variations on this, uh, uh, on the tasks that, uh, in the tasks that produce this phenomenon. Um, uh, and so you can do it with letters and numbers, you could do it with uh, colors, you can do it with um, uh, uh, tactile stimuli, um, you can do it with uh, images of scenes, faces, uh, so it's really, it's kind of in, in many ways it's, um, or you can use it even, you can produce it even with words. 
Um, and, uh, and, and so it, because of the variety of stimuli that you can use to produce the phenomena, it's thought to be relatively, it's kind of this central kind of, it, it reflects some central um, uh, uh, or more general processing impairment when the system is pushed to its limits. And is that, and so that's, is that like a working memory type limit? Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, the theories differ in exactly the limit. It's, it's not, um, because your working memory capacity is, um, full because it's just usually one or two items. And we know that our working memory capacity is around three ish, three to four mm -hmm. items. Um, there's some ideas that it actually, what the impairment is, is the failure to get encoded into working memory. Um, and so it doesn't even get there or if it does it's degraded in some way shape or form mm -hmm. um yeah so that's really what got me interested in studying attention actually that phenomenon uh and uh i was lucky uh at the time um the, my immediate so pierre jolliker was my honors thesis advisor and um but the graduate student that i worked most directly with was um karen arnell who was one uh, who's a, who was on the original papers with uh, uh, Jane Raymond and Kim Shapiro. And Karen Al Arnell is now a professor at uh, Brock University in Canada. Mm -hmm. Were you, was your early research all focused on visual attention? It was. Um, and so all the way, in fact, for the vast majority of my career, I've been focused on visual attention, um, whether it's been the atten attentional blank or... Uh, other aspects of attention, like the mechanisms that control attention. Um, but the interest is, so vision is an easy way to get at the attention system. Uh, so attention is uh, operates in, in all the sensory modalities. Uh, and it's just, uh, vision is an easy way to get, get in, uh, in, in, way, in, in is one way to think about it. Is the basic process in the brain the same uh, like you have some sort of maybe top-down attention and it, it applies more or less equally to all of your different sensory regions or is there something uniquely different about vision given how dominant it is just as our ma main sense and uh, taking up so much space in the brain yeah so th that's a really good question Adam so th there are um Mo, you know, kind of modality specific mechanisms and modality general mechanisms. Um, and so and it, one kind of way to think about the modality general sy systems or not think about, but, you know, there's, there's essentially in attention, there's a, a, a network that's involved in or responsible for our vo voluntary control over our current focus of attention. Um, and there's another system that is responsible um, or reacts to unexpected um, salient events in the environment um, that can disrupt, act as a circuit breaker for our current focus of attention that's maintained by the, this more volitional control system. Those aspects of attention are by and large modality general. So they work, you know, you can... Um, uh, you can see engagement of those two networks, whether you're dealing with visual stimuli or auditory stimuli or some mix of both or, you know, other senses. It's just the other senses don't tend to be investigated as frequently because they're more challenging oftentimes to uh, manipulate and measure. You say there's two types of attention, like a top-down, your applying a filter to what your sense data is sort of just unconsciously gathering versus a sort of filter of whether to even gather to begin with. Like, so what, one hypothesis is that we're sort of unconsciously perceiving the whole world at all times, and then we just filter it afterwards. And then another one is something like the sense organs themselves are selective and are filtering out stuff that never even makes it to any layer of the brain. Um. Well, so when I was talking about these two aspects of attention, these two aspects of con the control of attention, I was talking about something different than what you're mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Um, 
So what you're really talking about is um, essentially when attention operates, you know, with, mm -hmm. uh, and um, kind of the underlying assumption there is that there's so much information in the environment to process at any given point in time, there needs to be some mechanism essentially to filter it down, to, to winnow it down to, into something that our working memory systems can accommodate. Um, and that's been a matter of when exactly attention uh, uh, acts to fil as a filter on the incoming sensory inf uh, uh, information has been a matter of historical debate. Um, and in fact, from you know, the, the mid fifties, the mid 1950s, when essentially it was the dawn of the cognitive revolution, when people started to study these things, you know, in volume more extensively, um, you know, the, there was almost at the outset, there was this debate between when attention operated, whether it was early, um, kind of at a perceptual level, you know, uh, sensory perceptual level, or was it, whether it was later, and, you know, essentially everything gets processed, as you said, kind of on, you know, uh, to a very high level um, automatically, and then attention serves to select um, uh, from those highly processed representations. That debate kind of carried on in the, in the literature, um, probably up until, you know, you know, the mid nineties, early two thousands. And it's kind of it's basically at this point, it's, it's something that it's attention can operate at multi, it's a multi-level selection process. Um, and so in, in the things that determine when attention operates uh, or serves to filter out information is dependent on a number of different factors, but one of them is task demands. And one of the first people to mention or our previous experience with stimuli and one of the first per per people to propose that was Ann Treisman in 1964. Um, but in more contemporary, uh, it's been Nilly Levy um, in the mid 90s who proposed a theory that suggests, you know, essentially that perceptual load is one of the key things that determines when or task difficulty determines when attention uh, select serves to filter information out. Is this related to the famous gorilla experiment where people are tr passing basketballs amongst each other and your goal as the participant is to count how many times the basketball is thrown and most people are so focused on the little orange ball that they don't notice when a gorilla walks off screen uh, in the background? Yeah, there's some certainly some relation there, and there's other examples of that as well. There's you know in some of the older literature. Um, so the one thing, so where it's kind of a little bit different is that, um, you know, that task. I mean, the task itself, you know, that the classic one with the gorilla, um, it's not super challenging. I mean, it's a it's a little bit challenging. There's a lot going on, um, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's certainly, uh, I guess. Uh, a more intuitive demonstration of, of that. Um, the, there's other examples you, in the auditory domain as well. Some of the early uh, selective attention studies, you know, looked had presented people with, um, had people wear headphones and they presented people with streams on in either the left ear or the right ear. And um, they were usually text passages and they, were atten they would attend to the left ear or the right ear. And, and not surprisingly, they could remember things really well on the attended ear. Um, but they couldn't recognize things uh, or say very much about what was on the unattended ear, um, even very simple perceptual characteristics. Um, and that just kind of gets at this, you know, uh, the selective nature of attention. So attention can be really good at um, kind of winnowing down the sensory environment based on our goals. Um, it's not perfect and it does fail. But if the other ear, you hear your name called, you said it suddenly breaks your attention and you do notice that, right? So there's something that's like subconsciously monitoring for something relevant or not. Sure. The, I mean, the, so that, that the first empirical demonstration of that was by Neville Morey in the 1959, the, the kind of, that's the, the cocktail party phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things about that particular finding, I mean, so attention you know it can kind of block you know filter out information but it's it's not like those sensory those sense organs are completely shut off 
right? Um, so on the unattended side, it's not like those things are completely shut off. So they're still working. It's just the um, it does the information that they're uh, receiving doesn't reach conscious awareness. Um, the cocktail party phenomenon experiment. So in the original paper, so we all, I mean, you've had, the, I'm sure you've had that experience. I've had that experience where we notice our name on kind of the neighboring conversation in a loud and kind of boisterous room. Um, the, in the original paper, so it, it, the idea is that it, this is a u ubiquitous phenomenon. In the original paper, only three out of the, three or four out of the 12 subjects that Moray ran actually showed that phenomenon. Um, but it's still a compelling one. And what it does indicate is that there is some processing, high level processing of information, even though we d may not be actually actively attending to that information. Um, and in fact, that finding was um, kind of, is what led, one of the things that led Ann Treisman to propose um, her uh, filter attenuation theory in the 1960s. Um, and one of the ideas with the names is that we have, um, we have a lot of experience with our names, right? Uh, our own name. And it's also emotionally important to us. Uh, and those factors can influence um, not the perceptual processing of that information, perhaps making it more likely it survives um, or, or is not filtered out. And so essentially you can think of it like those, those factors are um, uh, changing the width of the filter a little bit for that specific stimulus and they're increasing the likelihood that it might get through. So is, is, is there some part of our brain that is subconsciously monitoring everything for what whatever that goal relevance is? And then what would the goal be in this case? You mentioned we have a lot of experience with our names and we can say our names are important because well, if something's relevant to us, maybe that's important for like survival reasons. And you can craft an evolutionary story of different ways attention could be filtered. Uh, is that what you're getting at? Well, um, so I, I think uh, the search for kind of the spot that is, you know, monitoring all things at all times, I, I think is, is uh, if you find that spot, let me know, because I think, you know, that <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a pretty important finding. Um, there are, some, there is some evidence that in some certain task situations that, you um, that uh, some regions of the brain are actually able to monitor for certain probabilities over extended period, probabilities of specific events over extended periods of time, um, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, especially on the right side, that's part of this more kind of bottom up attention network. Um, some people have thought that that region might be doing that. Um, so, uh, you know, there, I think at some level there's probably there is some kind of there is some uh, aspect of this the the brain or or the kind of the cognitive system that can monitor, but it's it can only do so much. Um, so there was another part of that question that I wanted to pick up on. Um, you had mentioned about the evolutionary um, pressures for different oh, yeah. things that stand out more than others. Yeah, yeah. So that's that. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, part. Um, it's something that I'm becoming be, have become more um, interested in in recent times. Is really what are the evolutionary pressures on? You know, like why do we have attention in the first place? Um, and you know, so it really is more of a functional explanation of uh, of attention. Um, and you know, certainly there are. There, there would be pressures on us uh, on the system to um, monitor for you know salient events in our environment that um, may predict food or kind of other you know we're social beings other important social uh, um, uh, bits of information so there might be a good reason for 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 the system to have the capacity to monitor the environment for those things. Would you say that it would make sense to think of there like being like a hierarchy of attention and conscious awareness is only somewhere many levels up, but in order for something to even come to conscious awareness, it sort of has to pass through a bunch of other lower layers that are filtering things out? 
I think, you know, there's, there's certainly a hierarchy of attention. And, and one of the tricks, one of the additional kind of things that makes this field both interesting and challenging at the same time is that um, that single word attention is used to refer to many different things. Um, and, and so, uh, but I, I think, you know, I and mean, we can go down that path if you want, but um, I think, yes, there is a hierarchy of attention and um, its relationship with consciousness is one that's kind of, um, you know, a, cer a certain sector of the literature is really heavily interested in. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that at, you know, a number of uh, people would agree with the statement that um, essentially you, if you're, uh, you need attention for consciousness, but that is, mm -hmm. that is actually a debatable point. Is it, one of that, very... um, one of those camps, the free energy principle types like Carl Fridson, who are, who theorized that the brain is constantly making a predictive model of the world and there's going to be some degree of mismatch between the model of the world and the actual world and your goal is to minimize the en energy or entropy that it takes uh like to to align those two so attention uh, is like the more you the more attention the more focus you have on let's say updating this particular part of the model to try and minimize the entropy there i you know honestly i can't recall what friston says specifically about attention um it seems your 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 characterization seems consistent with my understanding of his uh his ideas but um i'm not 100 percent sure honestly so we, let's go let's go into the different definitions of attention because we've been talking about it for like 20 minutes probably each with our own definition in mind and all listeners with their own definition of mind. I'm sure there's mostly overlap, but maybe not. Yeah. So, so one of the things that um, maybe as a starting point for that discussion, um, one of the, so one of the undergraduate classes I teach is a, a class on um, research methods to study attention. And one of the first things and in, in, uh, that, I try to emphasize to my students is that um, that attention is a multi-dimensional construct, um, and there's several functions, or you know, or several several uh, functions. Probably the best way to characterize it, um, uh, or types of attention you can think of it as. Um, so, uh, so for example, there's you know what I call the streamer function of attention, which is basically selective attention. We've talked about that way. The, the capacity of, um, based on some instruction or goal for us to be able to attend to a particular aspect of our environment. Um, so attend to a particular location or for a particular object um, or to a particular part of our body, you know, whether it's a left ear or the right ear or left hand or the right hand, but also internal trains of thought are really important as well. Those are uh, important foci. So you can selectively attend to both the sensory environment, but also selectively attend to um, internal trains of thought. Um, the, uh, sorry, I'm just bumping up my light here. It's getting a little dark. Um, lots of rain here today. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's, there's also, so that's one um, way to characterize attention. And, and each of these different functions of attention Really, have been have been investigated in different sectors of the of the literature. Um, the, there's what I call the decider, essentially response selection. So when you're faced with a task um, that um, requires that requires you to make a decision between two alternatives or four alternatives or you know simple identification of items, um, there's a different there. That's a different function of attention. Um, and uh, you know, oftentimes that's studied in dual task paradigms. Um, uh, so the, the the idea of a response selection bottleneck is one that was popularized by um, Harold Pashler. Uh, you know, where there's a limit, a fundamental limitation in being able to being able to choose more than one response um, uh, to two different stimuli. Uh, that. Uh, um, 
another function of attention is essentially um, performance monitoring or monitoring. Um, uh, so of our own performance over time. Uh, so just like, you know, in this conversation, we might be kind of thinking, okay, am I, am I, am I being clear? Maybe I'm not being clear. Do, how do I do I adjust in response to what I just said? You know, and so in, ta in experimental tasks, um, we're constantly doing that. Am I maintaining? Am I maintaining my performance consistent with my own abilities and in, in response to the task goals? Um, there's also uh, something. There's a, an interesting aspect of attention that is also related to all of these uh, factors, which is um, essentially an influencing uh, uh, what I call the influencer, which is essentially what you would probably think of more intuitively as a top-down. A top down effect of attention, where just by the mere act of thinking about or attending to a particular location, the cortical representations that um, or cortical regions that represent that location can alter, can uh, the activity in those regions can be altered based on just that simple act of being instructed to attend to that location. Um, and that's been observed not just in humans, but in other uh, species. Um, Can you give an example of that? Yeah, so very simple, like one of the classic ways in which people study visual selective spatial attention um, is to present people with a simple cue. Uh, you could, it could be an arrow at fixation, and that cue indicates the most likely location of an upcoming target. Um, this task was popularized by Mike Posner. Um, it, the seminal study was 1980. Um, and that cue, you know, let's say 80% of the time it's correct. Um, and so if I, if I cue you um, in this direction, show a stimulus out here, 80% of the time it'll be out here. Sometimes it'll be over here. And, and what happens is that when, so that stimulus could be uh, just a simple abrupt onset and you have to press a space bar as quickly and accurate as possible, or it could be you know one of two possible letters and you have to choose which, which one it is. Um, invariably response times are faster. Um, when the stimulus is presented in the cued location versus the uncued location. And the idea is that, you know, in response to that instruction to attend, you know, from the cue by in, provided by the cue, you're essentially moving your attention to that location, biasing kind of the cortical representations for that location. And then when a stimulus is presented there, that stimulus is going to be processed more efficiently or, or something of that sort. If um, you set out to say, I'm going to always look first in the direction opposite the arrow, then does that work? Or is this more like a subconscious, as soon as you see the arrow, you're, you're almost forced to devote more attention to that direction. Uh, that's a very, that, so that's a very good qu question. So, so just, I just want to say one thing, just to clarify something in this task, people are in, and in most attention studies, uh, most typically people are instructed to maintain fixation. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a it's a movement of attention without moving the eyes, and that's something that's called covert attention, mm -hmm. um, which is actually not normally how we attend to things in the environment. But in the empirical in the experimental study of attention, it's a very powerful way to s try to separate um, the the cognitive act of attending versus the ocular motor act of moving your eyes. It also has the advantage of stabilizing. The visual stimulation of um, of your task and ensuring that um, that when a stimulus is presented at that at that location, you're stimulating the same cortical representation across trials. So um, you're looking in the center, but you're reporting on whether something appears in the left or right of your periphery. Exactly, that's exactly right. Um, and so, uh, and so. I'm going to get back to your question about this kind of if you willfully attend to the, the opposite direction. Um, but uh, so one of the things that will happen that we've observed in humans where um, so typically in behavioral tasks, you're looking at the response to the target in imaging studies, whether you're doing it with EEG or fMRI, um, what you can do is you can actually time a lot your analysis to the cue. And the idea is that because the cue represents the instruction to attend, um, if you look in the cortical representations of the attended location in advance of the target, you can actually look for these biasing signals. Um, 
And a number of studies, including some of my own, have shown that in response to the cue and before the target, um, you see these increases in activity in the cortical representation of the attended locations or the cortical representation of attended features. Um, and, and so that's kind of an example of this biasing mechanism. So if the target is on the left and yeah. before the participant actually reports seeing it on the left, you'll see activity in the right brain, which would map onto that left vision area. Correct. Yeah. Cool. And so, um, and uh, so Sabine Kastner showed this in the late nineties and in, in uh, uh, using fMRI, um, we've shown it using fMRI in response to cues. Um, it's been shown in non-human primates. So Steve Black showed this in 1997 in non-human primates as well, um, where uh, you, know, you see this increase in firing rate in uh, representations in the kind of in the in populations that represents uh, specific locations, attended locations in the absence of actual visual stimulation. And do you see that time lag because your vision areas of the brain see the target first, but then they have to then communicate with either your language or your motion area and like send the signal downwards so it takes longer to catch up? Uh, well, so we have a cue, then a delay, then a target. It does take time because there is this, you know, you're absolutely right. You have to interpret what the cue is telling you, right? And so there is a, the, there is a time delay um, between when that cue is presented and when you'll see these biasing signals um, and, you know, before the target's presented. Um, I should also mention that these biasing signals tend to be relatively small compared to the actual benefit kind of uh, attention related modulation that you see in response to the actual target stimulus. And not all, uh, and we know also too from the non human primate studies that not all neurons in, will show these biasing signals. Mm -hmm. So, that earlier question about what if you were looking in the opposite direction or just told to who fixate on or told to do what the opposite of what the arrow is telling you to do. That's kind of yep. like a flanker inhibitory control type task. Has that been yep. done in this attention research? Yes. And, and so the, there are counter predictive cues. Um, and so it's important to know that, you know, these cues don't have to be arrows. They can just be simple symbols too. Like you could, you could just do arbitrary letters and you'll get the same effect. It, and it's really just how people interpret them. Um, and so um, arrows are a little bit different because they have such a strong kind of stimulus or kind of uh, stimulus location mapping that it's a little harder to override, but you you can actually um, see cueing effects counter, what they, we call them counter predictive cueing effects in response to arrows. So it's really just about the instruction. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's the important thing. And there's the, is there a learning effect where as people become more familiar with the symbol, they get better? There, there is a learning effect um, that will depend on kind of how complicated the stimulus is mm -hmm. and the mapping to a particular location and how many locations or how many features. So there's a lot of things that will go on uh, that will determine that. You mentioned that in a lot of these lab tasks, people are asked to fixate like on a particular area of the screen, and that doesn't map on to how real vision works, where in the real world, we're kind of darting our eyes around all the time. And I know that some of your research works on, uses VR to try and make make it more ecologically valid uh, to as to how we're perceiving things in the real world. Yeah, so um, the... So let, I'm going to start with um, the just the the distinction between you know this covert attention the way to study attention using a, a covert manipulations um, versus overt manipulations. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know the natural thing is to um, move our eyes right to um, to whatever it is we're attending to, um, and. As I, as I mentioned before, the reason why we study co study attention covertly is to try to make sure, you know, it's two, primarily for two reasons. Um, one is to uh, try and separate kind of the cognitive 
function, the cognitive act of attending from the ocular motor act. Um, and then the other is uh, when we're con if we're concerned about these, you know, studying the neural populations, making sure that we're stimulating the same bits of cortex. Um, so, uh, and so for that fixation is really important. Um, with uh, overt attention, you know, there's still, there, there's plenty of studies that, that have looked at overt attention. And, and when you actually allow people to move their eyes, you know, um, you see, if anything, you see some really, you, some of the benefits you see are actually larger. Um, some of the costs also happen to be larger too. So uh, if you move your eyes to a position um, and the target doesn't actually appear there, um, it's gonna take you longer to react um, if, um, uh, you know, it, so it's, it's more costly in a sense. Um, the, uh, the kind of this more, the more natural approach to studying attention using eye movements also is much more challenging. Um, especially if you're interested in neural in measuring neural activity, because eye movements, if you do scalp recorded electroencephalography, for example, um, eye movements cause large muscular artifacts um, that can contaminate the data. But I, I think it's still important to do that, to do those studies, because it gives us a better sense of what's going on in natural vision, which leads into the, some of this work that you had alluded to that we're doing with virtual reality. Um, the and not just with virtual reality, but a large chunk of the work in my lab now is trying to push the kind of um, the study of attention from the lab to outside to really try, try to understand more naturalistic behaviors and kind of the consequences of engaging our body um, for the attention system for the cognitive system. Um, and VR is a really nice tool for doing that, and not just VR, but also so VR um, just to kind of get some terms straight. So virtual reality is essentially what is immersive virtual reality is where you um, people wear a, a complete headset um, and you, you've you constructed a you know a, an entirely new environment within that headset. So there, there's no input from the outside world other than the person's proprioception of actually moving around. Um, augmented reality, on the other hand, is something is, a, is an approach um, where you can, uh, people are still wearing a headset, but it's a visor um, and you can project um, uh, virtual objects in space in 3D in, on that visor that make it look like it's, they're embedded in the environment. And so coupled with that, those virtual objects, you actually have the real environment as well. The nice thing that both of these approaches have for uh, um, studying real world attention related behaviors is that um, you can tightly control the kinds of stimuli and the timing at which they're presented and their positioning um, more than you could just in uh, taking advantage of the natural environment. So it gives a kind of an e intermediate step of control over kind of the, the, um, the kind of high variability that exists in everyday in, in typical visual environments outside the lab and the kind of almost ridiculous amount of control and abstraction that occurs in traditional lab-based tasks. So it's kind of a nice midpoint. And so it's a, it's a really useful, those are both of those approaches are really useful tools for, um, for experimentation uh, and, and manipulation of the visual environment. Would um, you be manipulating primarily basic proce uh, properties like size and shape to see how that influences attention? Or do you also get into the more subjective emotional realm like let's say something is the same size or shape or maybe like it's an animal but it has a threatening versus non-threatening face and do you give more attention to threat cues or something like that oh the, well both of the uh so we do a little bit of both actually um the um so one of the initial studies so a lot of these the virtual reality studies we do in collaboration um with uh a faculty colleague of mine in computer science, his name is Tobias Hollerer. Um, and our initial studies in that in this domain have really been focused on trying to understand just kind of the basics of attention, um, you know, attention uh, and how it works when people are searching the environment for specific objects. 
Um, and in those particular, in those initial studies, what we're really interested in is um, how people, you know, when people navigate through an environment searching for objects. So what we did in, in our in our first study was we we mapped um, a large area of our campus, um, and then embedded uh, virtual objects, you know, it's essentially to make a scene that people would have to navigate through. Um, and uh, within that scene, there were these gems that were scattered about. And so people just had to go and find these gems. And while they did that, they did this in two conditions, two conditions, well, a single individual would do it in two conditions, one in which they would navigate um, and find the gems. They had to discriminate the gems based on their surface texture and their orientation. Um, and they did that uh, alone or in addition to doing an auditory task. So essentially a divided attention situation. Um, half of the subjects did that at low light, you know, just before sunset and half the subjects did it at dark and uh, after sunset. Um, and uh, so we were interested in kind of the impact of the additional dual task on search performance. Um, and we were interested in, in the lighting conditions uh, on search performance because um, the commercially available headsets, their luminance properties or luminance control is relatively limited. And so what ends up happening is that the virtual objects are quite bright um, relative to uh, the natural objects. Um, especially at night. And what we found in that particular study is search behavior was really influenced by lighting condition. Um, and uh, to the point where they were impaired or less likely to be able to remember objects, real objects, and more likely to run into real objects, especially at night. Um, and so essentially it, it limits one's awareness of the real world. Um, um, and so that was kind of a counterintuitive. We weren't expecting that finding actually. Um, and it has pretty major implications for um, people who want to use these in real world settings, right? So it can really impact your your ability to recall objects. Um, it's like uh, in a video game where you have a glowing quest objective and you ignore yeah. everything else. Yeah, that's right. And and we we replicated that in a follow-up study that's just uh, just got recently accepted. So it's it's something that's consistent. Um, the uh, the other study, so you had mentioned about stress um, or kind of emotional balance. Um, one of the things that we've been interested in over the years um, is the effect of our physiological arousal on uh, attention. Um, and one of the ways that we've been doing manipulating, so we manipulate that using exercise. Um, sometimes we do it, um, by exposing people to acute stressors, like uh, physical noxious stressors, like cold pain. Um, and sometimes we do it uh, using time pressure uh, and scary music. And so we have this recent collaboration with um, Mary Hagerty in my department, and Michael Baylor, uh, where uh, who both have a lot of experience, also a lot of, of experience in spatial navigation and VR. Um, where people are uh, ex exposed in, in immersive virtual reality, they are um, trained to learn a route in a maze, to, uh, uh, to find different objects in a maze. And so they know where, they learn where the objects are located. And then at test, um, they uh, are put back in the maze um, and asked to, find the most direct route to that, or they get, they are told to go find this object and then they have to find the most direct route to that object. Um, and they can take, uh, they can take a, a route that they learned, which may not be the most direct route or they can take a, short, a shortcut. Um, and one of the key manipulations in this study is that they do this under kind of natural conditions, you know, no stress, or they do it um, under stress. And the stress is time pressure, fog and scary music. And then once in a while, walls of the maze will kind of drop down. And it, it really, I've gone through this and made me jump. Uh, and it changes people's behavior, how they how they navigate through the environment. Um, and so we're, we've become really interested in this, this phenomenon and we uh, you know, are currently exploring the additional 
cognitive impacts of these stress stressors. And so if, if you're scared and stressed, then you might think that your attention is worse because, well, you're stressed and that takes yeah. cognitive load. But then you could also think like if you're jumpy and if there's you're in a threatening environment, you might pay more attention to things because like it's, it's a fight or flight thing, maybe like which one of those? Yeah. Which one, which one wins? Yeah. Yeah. So it, you know, it actually depends on, um, so it depends on how acute the stressor is. Uh, and, and so there's, um, a really, so one of the ideas in the literature is that if you have a very brief acute stressor, um, the effects on, on attention and executive function is, is not, are not static. So what will happen is that early after the acute stressor, essentially there is this impairment of your executive functioning system. So, um, and an overactivation of um, what's called the, kind of the salience network, or the network that's responsible for, you know, re reacting quickly to unexpected events. And so um, uh, you, you kind of lose inhibitory control. And so what might end up happening is you might get more captured by things, uh, um, be more jumpy uh, essentially. And so um, depending on the time, but uh, over time, that kind of that imbalance between the functioning of these networks flips back to its normal state, which usually the executive attention system is, you know, kind of controls things and allows you to maintain your task set. Um, and so in this particular experiment, we're not manipulating the time between, you know, when they get stressed and you know when they do the task but the the prediction would be that early on you might get more distracted by potentially salient things um, and that would be more um, impairing on your performance um, if those things were totally task irrelevant uh -huh. that's interesting i would have expected the opposite being that an acute stressor could like kick in some sort of fight or flight system of like, you, you're going to need to devote more attentional resources for this very short time, but then maybe that's exhausting. So then if the stress persists, persists over time, then you, your attention would start to fail you. Yeah. Well, um, that's an interesting prediction. I, there may be some situations that that might work. I, I think there's probably a lot of uh, potential, there's going to be some differences across the kinds of stressors that might induce that. Um, mm -hmm. and perhaps in your task set. Um, but uh, this one particular, there's a really nice review paper by Hermans in 2014 that look, uh, kind of talks about this kind of interplay between these two networks as a function of an acute stressor. Um, what happens when the stress is physical exercise? So you, so physical exercise in the short term can induce a state of arousal. Um, so very, and most of our work has been focused on these brief, uh, essentially exercise induced arousal effects and, and acute, other acute stressors can do the same thing. Um, but if you prolong them and the intensity is, uh, is high enough, then, then that's when you start to see impairments occur. So, so one of the things that we've seen with brief bouts of exercise, so I'm talking here about um, 15 to 30 minutes of uh, moderate intensity exercise. So something where you know, you're breathing hard, but you can still talk. Um, what, what will happen is that um, essentially that acts like an arousing an arousal stimulus. Um, and so in very simple tasks, you actually respond faster. That's what I was thinking. If it's like a yeah. short term, maybe I should have used the word arousal instead of stress. Yeah. So, so what, um, what will likely happen is you'll respond faster. So, but if it's a really salient stimulus, that's task irrelevant, you'll, you'll respond to that over a task relevant stimulus, or instead mm -hmm. of withholding your response, waiting for the task relevant stimulus. But in our studies, um, in some of our early work, we showed the speeding up of response times, actually um, an increase in the amplitude of some early sensory evoked responses um, recorded mm -hmm. with EEG uh, in, a, in a manner that looks actually quite like the kind of more traditional attention related effects that uh, one would see, say, with spatial attention. Mm -hmm. um, and that was work that we did 
you know, around we published around 2015. So we had to develop um, protocols for actually uh, for measuring EEG while people are engaged in physical activity. So I had mentioned earlier that um, when even just a simple act of moving your eyes can introduce a lot of noise into the EEG signal that we measure. You know, so these are electrodes placed on the scalp um, that measure postsynaptic activity from large populations of neurons. Um, and when you move your eyes, you, it, so the, the, um, it creates these large muscular artifacts. But those electrodes are also sensitive to all sorts of other kinds of artifacts. And movement and sweating are two that can really cause a lot of problems. And so we have to develop protocols that would allow us to collect reasonably clean EEG data while people were engaged in physical activity. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we made sure that people weren't exercising too hard or for too long to reduce the amount of sweating. Um, the other thing that we did was in our kind of con different conditions, people cycled at the, at the same cadence to control the movement artifact. So it, was, it wasn't that there was no movement artifact, but the movement artifact was the same. And so, and simple subtraction logic is that, you know, um, if they're the same, then, and not related to your task, then, you know, the differences will kind of cancel each other. Those artifacts will cancel each other out when you do your comparisons. And so we did a few other things as well to kind of mitigate these effects. And, and then we were able to get reasonable EEG data and reveal that uh, these changes in brain activity as a function of um, exercise. Do you see differences based on people's fitness or exercise activity? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So in um, we've looked uh, several in several of our studies to look at whether there's um, a, a correlation between their aerobic fitness and um, the attention related modulations that we see in the EG activity, and we we've not seen any um, mm -hmm. uh, with the brief bouts of exercise. With more prolonged bouts of exercise, so in one of our early uh, exercise studies. It wasn't an EEG study. It was um, a study in which people would ride the bike for 15 minutes and then do an attention task for um, 10 minutes, and then they would alternate that. And they did that for two hours. Um, and uh, in that situation, what we saw was that um, the the benefit kind of so everyone over time, not surprisingly, you pra get practice on the task and your performance speeds up, but people who had a higher aerobic capacity, that speed up was uh, more uh, increased. So they actually better fitness, better learning on the task. Um, uh, and so that's the correlations that we've seen. Um, across the literature, it tends, the correlations tend to consistently come out with these more prolonged bouts. The acute bouts, it's a little less consistent. And in a way, this has come full circle from physical education. It has. and. Um, over the years, you know, that's kind of, so when I started, when I switched to doing kind of only attention, I always wanted to get back. Um, and, and uh, but I needed, I, I felt like I needed to learn how to do science. Um, and, and so the first part of my career really was focused on how to do science. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and now I kind of feel like at this stage, I've, I've, I've learned how to do it okay. And so I can now explore a little bit more. And I also have the freedom and I have some fantastic students that are interested in these topics as well. And so we kind of tackle these problems together. And so it really has come full circle. What does physical activity and exhaustion look like compared to cognitive physical exhaustion? Like let's say you are sitting in class all day and you had a really difficult exam. And on one hand, you're just sitting in a chair. So your body's not really being exhausted, but if cognitively you're exhausted, it seems to have the same effects. I, I remember reading that chess mat gra chess grandmasters can burn like thousands of calories during a tournament because they're just so focused. Does that come up yeah. in this link between attention and exercise at all? Yeah, so it's that's a really interesting question. In fact, uh, um uh, next, in, I'm teaching a new class um, uh, for upper division students here, and it's called the Active Brain. And next week is our last week recorded. The last two classes are on fatigue 
and failure. Um, and I just finished reading this really interesting chapter from a book from my colleague, Scott Grafton on, on failure and on fatigue. And it's, and there's, there, um, there's a different couple of different components to fatigue. There is a physiological, there is physiological fatigue. So, um, that, you know, your muscles can only do so much, right. Um, and there's a buildup of lactate and, you know, that's going to degrade their capacity to function and, and things of that sort. But a big component of fatigue, and this is true, whether it's cognitive fatigue or physical fatigue is an the emotional kind of appraisal of that state. And um, those, that factor actually is a really critical, plays a really critical role, whether it is because you are doing an ultra marathon or whether you're doing something that's really cognitive demanding, it's your emotional appraisal. And that can actually have a, a bigger impact on when you quit, uh, when you quit running or quit the you know cognitive task, um, or then the actual phys physiological aspect of it. If you, if it's physical exhaustion, your body starts releasing endorphins to compensate and make you feel better. Does that also happen with cognitive exhaustion? That's a great question. I honestly I don't know the answer to that. I um, if I had to, uh, I would think that there would be a point at which there you would get similar kinds of release because there when you solve problems when you address yeah you know when, when you think through and solve problems there is a rewarding component to that i don't know if it would be endorphins or something else but um certainly something that uh really has a positive impact on your appraisal of that situation i certainly see the interesting full circle connection between psychology and physiology Barry, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it, Adam.